One, two, three. Was... Uh, it's 10, 10 p.m. after a long day, so. <laughs> I was thinking that you were really trying to prove how far you can lay back. Yeah, that, that, is, that is my time feel right there. <laughs> so, Tom. <laughs> Hello. If we finally get to meet and, you know, you're very welcome. And uh, it's <laughs> it's great to be here, dude. It's great. We, we've been we've been actually messaging a little bit back and forth for quite a few years now, but we've never actually spoken. Well, this this counts as in person in twenty twenty one, I guess. But in, let's that use the term in person. So it's this great, great, to, great to see you. Likewise, and you know what? I have I actually have to thank you for something that you. Well, wait a second. I think I told you that I was thinking about um, just giving up the guitar. I was just like, I'd had it. And I saw one of your courses. This is the good old plug. He didn't tell me to do this, folks. No, I've um, not paid you any money. <laughs> I saw one of your courses and I was like, you know, it's been a long time since I've done, you know, anything like that. And I bought one of your courses and I got actually inspired to start practicing again after just not. That's so, amazing. Though the, Those occasionally people email me when they've bought the stuff and you know, at very occasionally they'll complain, but mostly Jeez. when they say something nice, if they say that, that they've been inspired to play or to do something different or whatever, those are the best compliments really. So that's amazing. Thank you. That's great to hear. I mean, thank you because it got me to think about, um, it got me to think about things in a, actually a little bit different way. And I stole some of your stuff, some of your pedagogical approach, which I'll tell you about that later. Um, it, it actually was a real, it, it really helped. It, it helped to make one of my videos, which you will see right up here right now, uh -huh. <laughs> which has nothing to do with playing legato. Um, okay. Okay. I'll tell you, <laughs> um, what it was, was you were playing, um, I don't know, maybe even just a scale and you were saying, Okay, so if there's three notes per string, you know, your tendency is to go da 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 you know, how legato can sound. And then you said, no, think of the, um, after every four sixteenth notes, try an accent or at least think of that. To feel, to feel it, yeah. To feel where that downbeat is. Well, guess what? It, if, if people did that, who are, of course, nobody who's an economy picker is watching this because it's Tom Quayle. But in case that <laughs> there is somebody, one of the major problems with economy picking is that, well, there's a few of them. There's a few major problems that can be sorted early on mm. if you get the player to know where the downbeats are, especially when playing 16th notes, because the same thing exists probably even more so is to go ba da da ba da da ba da da ba da Absolutely, you know? yeah, absolutely. And the weird thing with economy picking is you have to pick up when your body is telling you feel down, you know? I mean, not feel down. <laughs> you might be feeling <laughs> no, down that feel you're down. playing. <laughs> you might be feeling down that you've decided to use economy picking. Yeah, I, yeah. I haven't had that feeling so bad yet, but it's it's happened. And to play in time, I stole exactly that idea which I think for legato playing is so important to know and to be able to emphasize that. It makes sense because it's the same thing. There is a bias in the technique towards the number of notes per string. And the idea is that you're doing the same. It's, it's exactly the same actually. Well, it's, it's not exactly the same because obviously you are picking everything, but always that next string is attacked with exactly the same kind of stroke. And inevitably, because of the weight of gravity, you're pushing down you know, you're actually moving the mass of the hand down, you're getting an accented stroke. So yep. that accent is making people hear those triplets or make not hear that it's making people feel the triplets. That's more important. Yeah. And I always say to people, and I'm sure this is what you, you do now as well. It's a lack of control. So it's, it's the lack of control to be able to feel that group of four. You're always feeling yes. the group of three. And it's something that like, it's almost like my gospel now. It's become so, because it's such a common problem for so many guitar players. And that's, I mean, I hadn't actually ever thought about it with economy picking, but it makes perfect sense. I mean, I'm a terrible economy picker. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things I can only do in one direction for some reason. I can only do it this way. Yes. As in yes. descending. Mm -hmm. I can't ascend with, and I can't sweep pick down if, if we're including that in the economy picking kind of canon, if you like. I can right. only do it upwards as well. So it's not something I've ever investigated, but you mention it there. It absolutely makes perfect sense. It's exactly. 
it's it's I think it is a brilliant piece of pedagogy that you've articulated that needs to be that it really needs to be picked up. It needs to be picked up by all teachers. And if you are a teacher and watching this and you don't quite know what we're talking about, um, is there is there any, well, there's Tom's course, but I don't know exactly where it is in the course. Um, there's also my video on economy picking, does economy picking work? It You should investigate this. If you don't know what Tom's talking about, I mean, do you, are you teaching Tom? I don't, I don't teach at all now. No, I, I do the odd thing here and there, but... I just don't, it's not actually, I don't have time. I just, um, it's not something I want to spend the very little bit of time I have doing because I've done so much of it in the past. I enjoy it, by the way. It's not something I don't enjoy, but I've got so much, and I've got a four-year-old now as well. So I try and reserve some time for that. We won't so get maybe, into that though. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we'll find out um, which course it is and I'll link that in the bottom. Which course? Yeah, it's, it, it's Modern Legato Part 1 is the one that deals, there's three parts to it and they all deal with separate elements of the technical approach. Um, and music, making it musical and creating lines. But part one is specifically what I would call the separation of numbers of notes per string from the subdivision. So you, you, right. you, don't, you're, you don't have the subdivision dictated to you by the number of notes per string. You're in control of the subdivision as opposed to the number of notes that you're playing on each string. Um, okay, so, uh, okay, so we're going to, we're veering pretty far off of how, where I want to go, which is perfect. Uh, it's exactly what it's exactly what I wanted to do. So let's say somebody is going to work on that. Somebody's going to first of all, if you didn't know, Tom, you've got um, a bevy, no, a gaggle, a pod. Um, I <laughs> think a colony. For... You have okay. a colony of quailiacs that you. I mean, you know it. I mean, I'm sure e your email box knows it. Um, your instant messenger knows it. And there's a lot of people who uh, listen, listen, you know, a lot of your fans and people who own your guitar and own your courses who listen and hang on every word you say as gospel. So seeing as you're preaching the gospel in real time, how does one start to make sense of controlling those you know, the, the, that physical aspect of, okay, I got three notes on a string. I'm going to try and control this group of four and the fourth note is on the next string. The, the first way I would start is I would just start with two strings. Uh, if we try and um, explain it this way. So a classic thing for guitar players to do is if you take the middle two strings, so the D and the G string, and just for the sake of argument, I'm just going to use numbers because it's just easier for now. I'm going to use both just for the people who are going to put something in the comments saying, why are you not using note names? So basically, if we're in if we're in the key of G, for example, we've got F sharp, G and A, which would be the fourth, fifth and seventh frets on the D string. And if you've got B, C and D, OK, so the same frets on the G string. This is a classic example of if somebody was going to pick, though, pick the first note of each string and hammer the next two and then obviously do the same thing on the next string. Mm -hmm. What happens is if you ask them to play this and you say to them, what I want you to do is to play 17 16th notes. Now, this instantly is like, whoa, people glaze over. <laughs> All that is, is playing. If you're playing 16th notes, you play for a full bar and then you play the first 16th note on the second bar. Mm -hmm. So you go dagger, 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 da, two, three, four, dagger, 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 da. Now, what most guitar players want to do when they play this phrase as 16th notes, they don't actually think about the subdivision at all. They want it to start here on the first note and finish on the last note of the physical grouping. So you get, basically people get stuck in kind of like, an infinite loop where they don't know where the end is. They want to go and they want it to finish there. They want it to finish where it started, basically. What people need to do is they need to sit down very, very slowly and count through that those subdivisions. So one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one. And that is where it finishes. Not back here or on the last note. And this, if, if guitar players have never done this before, this confuses the living, you pick your whatever out yeah. of them, you know? It's so confusing for people to have two, three, 
for I've got loads of delay on by the way I apologize I'm a delay fiend <laughs> now what you ought to, ought to be able to do when you've that's that's actually an oral practice method if you like because you're mm-hmm. learning what the sound of a full bar of 16th notes plus one on the beginning of the next bar sounds like that's super simple for most people if you just ask them to tap that out on their knee so if you went dagger 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 da, they'd be able to do that no problem most guitar players that's not a problem as soon as they have to apply it to a fingering that's the same number of notes per string three num- three notes per string that's where the confusion comes so it's getting that into your head if you only ever do it from the first finger, this is one of the things that I cover in Modern Legato Part 1. If you only ever do this from the first finger, you're causing yourself just as many problems as if you never did it in the first place. Because that means that you're now fixed and you can only start from that first finger and feel the subdivision correctly. So what you've got to do is you've got to do it from the first finger. So two, three, four. Now you have to start from the second finger and feel exactly the same exercise, but now the beginning and the end point have shifted. So it's just about developing the control over the subdivision from any given starting point when you've got three notes per string. So now you get one, two, three, four. Two, three, four. And one thing you can do to really help yourself here is not go because suddenly, if I'm accenting those string changes, which is what, again, a, a lot of legato that guitar players do sounds like this. It's like somebody falling down a flight of stairs yeah. and, you know, really badly injuring themselves at the bottom because they've got no control over uh, the footsteps they're taking. It's right, the same thing right. here. It needs to be this, this kind of, the way I was describe it, and this is something I've said so many times, so this is a bit of a cliche for me to say, I guess, for people who have seen me talk about this before. But it's like oh, if you took one of the old school, kind of the first analog synths and they had no velocity control. So no matter how hard you hit the key, they were, it was always the same volume. It was a fixed volume. In music, this is bad on a general level because you want dynamics in your playing. But when you're playing lines with legato or economy picking, What you actually want to do, unless you are in control of it, is remove the dynamics so that you're not forcing accents out without being in control of them. If you want to put accents into your playing and you're in control of those accents, that's one thing. That's a good thing. But if if you're doing this, that now, it would be cool. It's like there's a fine line. It's cool if you're doing it on purpose. It's really bad if you're doing it because you can't not do it, if that makes sense, right, if you're right. in control of it. So so again, it's just about going through each of those combinations. Start with the first finger, then the second finger, then the little finger, then start on the next string with the first finger, then the second finger and the little finger, and control that group of 17 16th notes, or a, again, a full bar plus one 16th note. When you can no. do that, sorry, go on. No, no, you, you, you go on. <laughs> I was going to say, when you can do that, then I would apply it to a larger structure, like, okay. I don't know, you, you, I mean, pick a scale, whatever it is. Let's say for the sake of argument, um, I usually do this with students with a major scale because it's fairly straightforward. So if you come up to the C major and did. So one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one. Almost every guitar player who's watching this will have to strain like crazy to not get that little finger to go down because you're so used to finishing the number of notes per string regardless of the subdivision or whether the rhythmic phrase has ended and when you when you get to the top obviously one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e i'm hyperventilating now three e i can't remember where i was but anyway you get the idea as you come down exactly <gasps> yeah. I need to be able to circular breathe. Um, yeah. So that's the idea. And then what happens is, as you get better at this, you can start to, again, if you're not going. I mean, they're super weird on the way back down because suddenly yep. you've got like three, 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 one, two, three, four, five, three, three. That The accent occurs in a really strange place. Once you can feel those subdivisions, if I tap my foot. starts to 
that's where the smoothness comes from and the control comes from, just being able to, to do that. But that's more advanced than this first do you, exercise. Do you ever try to do that and accent with your left hand the downbeats? No, at first I tried to experiment with that and I feel that that is asking almost superhuman levels of control over... Yeah. Or... or I guess you could call super, um, superhuman holdsworthy and levels of control. Although he didn't do that either. I mean, he, didn't he didn't do that. Him accenting particular notes in a phrase. I think to action, I, I suppose you you could do it if you were doing it very slowly. You could you could make a point of yeah, but it's not going to be something you're going to be able to do when you start even getting to this kind of a speed. This is where for me it's about. It's, it's more about feeling the subdivision and having it internalized than it is mm -hmm. actually playing the subdivision. Because this is where the big difference with picking comes in, not economy picking, because you also with economy picking would have to be superhuman to be able to accent, um, you know, that, that particular, what would it be? It would be a, an upstroke, wouldn't it? So it'd be down, um, up, down, down, up. To accent yes, that would be, yes. because the whole point is it's economy of motion. And to accent, you have to do some, you have to either squeeze the pick or do a bigger motion, which is very difficult to do within an econ economic movement, which is, again, this is a very economical movement with legato. Whereas when you're picking, if you go. That's not so much of an issue for people, even with, you know, I'm not going to do it crazy fast, but yeah. That's fine, but you can't do that with economy picking. I, I think I'm not good at economy picking, but I'm you, you know, you can do it at that tempo, but as you start cranking it up, it starts becoming more and more difficult. But yeah. I do think that there is um, there is an advantage to actually going through the process to learn. And actually what I did first was just marked which notes were, okay, it's the F, it's the, you know, so on and so forth. And then yeah. it, once I did that and I went through that ring of fire, it was a lot easier to, to start to be able to do it when I was improvising. Same thing applies as I was talking about here with this very basic exercise where from an improvisational perspective, you want the maximum number of starting points within a phrase or a scale where you, you don't have a bias towards starting on a particular finger. So if you were gonna do the economy picking or the legato with, um, and have control over it from any starting point, you have to do this exercise, not only starting on the first finger, so one E and a two, you have to do it starting from every finger, so second finger as well, one E and a two, and now the accent, the, the, the perceived or felt accent with legato would possibly, if you were practicing, you might actually accent as well, just to develop that control, would be now on the little finger, and if you started on the E, or the, I'm in C major, so the little finger, now you would have one E and a two, and the, this would be, the first finger would be the accented note. So I made sure when I was practicing this stuff that I started from every single possible starting point within a given harmonic structure, if you like, be it an arpeggio, be it a, a scale or whatever, or just, just a physical shape, like the two, one, two, one stuff. I would make sure I started from the second note within that phrase, the third note within that phrase, so on and so forth. So that, sorry, that was what I was going to ask. Uh, it's, it was basically, um, this is a whole, it's, it, it is the same conversation, but it's, it, it's also a, a quite a separate one in a way, because my picking is a big weakness, which is a funny conversation of itself, because to somebody who was just watching me pick, you wouldn't know. Because I've done clinics before, I've said, right, my picking sucks. And then I've done, you know, something like. There's nothing wrong with. I, it, it would appear externally like I can pick really well because I have yeah. raw speed, but I can only do it starting with an upstroke, two note mm -hmm. per string or four note per string. So I spent a lot of time as a, as a 15, 16 year old doing. All that nonsense, mm -hmm. um, which is useful, but not, you know, useful as you get older or more musically mature. <laughs> and if you want to keep your friends. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's terrible for that. If that's important to you, sure. 
<laughs> but that's not. I mean, we're in lockdown. Who cares about that? Exactly. Um, yeah. So, so uh, I I found that I could only do that with an upstroke because when I do it with a downstroke, I have an inherent bounce across the string, which is probably Troy Grady has the answer for it, and I just need to yeah. look into that. Um, but what that meant is that from the perspective of improvising, I can't rely on my picking technique to get me through improvised phrases that I want to play. So, so what it means is for, from an improvised perspective, I don't have anywhere near the freedom that I ha um, with picking that I have with legato. It's nowhere near. So with legato, I feel like I can, within the realms of the technique, because legato is kind of an, you can't do some of the big jumps that you can do with picking if you're sort of Steve Morse or whoever else, you know, right. any, any or, or any any of the modern jazz guys, so your Kreisbergs, your, your Rosenwinkels, so on and so forth. Um, there's the big jumps that that allows you. But my freedom is, is much greater because I have much more control over the technique. And I've sat for hours and hours and hours and hours, literal hundreds of hours trying to fix this picking problem, and I can't. So for instance, I'm a terrible bebop player because you need that control of the of the picking to get the accents right to make it swing so yeah. i can't do that for example now where that led was trying to find a way of playing the lines i wanted to play that would in that, that would enable me to be relaxed when i play and so because when you're on you know when you're on stage or when you're doing a clinic or when you're doing a recording session you can't have technique that's kind of on the edge you have to be fully in control of your technique and my, i was never fully in control of my picking technique so then i got into the legato thing and actually it came a lot from greg howe which is not, I don't think I, I do sound a bit like Greg Howe, but obviously I play, I have more jazz kind of stuff in my playing maybe than, than Greg Howe does, maybe a bit. He's, you know, fusion guy, of course. But but when I started experimenting with this stuff, I, it just seemed logical to me that you would need, I got into the subdivision thing and you would need to be able to do this from any given starting point within a phrase. Um, so I would take things like, <laughs> And I would feel like one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one. And then I would start from the second note. And this is a completely different challenge now because you've got three picked notes to start with, as opposed to pick, hammer, pick, middle, which is what I do here. Now you've got, what I do is I go pick, middle, pick. And it feels completely different to play on the guitar. The guitar, the, the phrases that you play on the guitar, the feel that you, not to the, not to the listener, but the way it feels for you to play mm -hmm. is so different depending on which, how you've arranged those notes on the, on the strings, if you like. So, so this phrase here is totally different to playing. Oh. That is really hard for me to do. Pick, middle, hammer, what do I oh. do? Pick, middle, hammer, middle. Okay. I have quite idiosyncratic hybrid picking, so yeah. it's, uh, I'm not, uh, uh, you know, the, the actual hybrid picking is not so much of the, the problem, because, but, but it's, it's, the, it's the arrangement that you've got, you've got a picked mm. note, a picked note, a hammered note, and then a picked note as opposed to you forced here to do three picked notes in a row and the hammer is occurring at a different point within the phrase. So that has kind of a natural lilt to it to me, as opposed to again, I can't really sing it, but the feel is different. If you try and play these two things. So I just I just explored all of those different possibilities so that when I'm improvising, like I'm in the key of G here, if I if I, I have I've tried to develop the ability to, to have a, a whole array of different pathways through the harmonic information. So if I'm like too much overdrive. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Or maybe. It's not one thing. It's not, I can start from any particular point within the scale and be able to construct in real time a 16th or triplet based line or an even or odd subdivision based line. 
because the starting point isn't going to trip me up. I don't have to always start from the same finger at the same point within the scale in order for the line to come off, if you like. That was so, right, so there's hundreds of hours behind that, obviously. Hundreds of obviously. hours, extremely slow practice. Really, really slow practice, keeping the technique exactly the same as it would be if I was playing up to whatever the arbitrary hypothetical subdivision or tempo was. But it would literally be, I'm going to add chromaticism in here as well, because I can't, it's difficult for me to switch it off. But like, again, in the key of G. And I'm making conscious decisions about where I'm going to go next. But I'm, I would normally do this slower than this, actually, but it's really boring to listen to. And it, it's, it starts to develop all of these pathways that you can take. So it's like having as opposed to a fixed piece of muscle memory, it's like having mm -hmm. hundreds of individual bits of muscle memory that you can pick and choose from in real time, depending on where you were the second before, if that makes sense. So there's, there's very rarely a point, unless I'm playing, harmonic minor would be an example, um, where I haven't sat and done this for long enough, even though I know the scale inside out, I haven't developed the physical pathways and the oral pathways to be able to do this in real time fast enough. But all of the melodic minor stuff, all the major scale modes, obviously all that stuff, the, the symmetrical scales, so the diminished scales, um, whatever, all that stuff is, 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 I've developed those pathways. So they're not fixed licks, but they are like, they, you might call them micro licks, micro, I, I call them fragments that you can mix and match and put together in such a way that it doesn't sound like you're playing the same lines all the time. Although they sound similar because obviously it's the style that I'm playing in. And the legato inevitably means that you get lots of very close knit intervals followed by some, some slightly larger ones, but not consistently large intervals. Well, see Tom, people see, people watch you play and the, immediately they, they think, well, I, I just want to play like that. I want to play fast like that. And a friend of mine um, recently, he has these four things that he's, he's actually a piper, he's an, an Illin piper, and, uh, but he has, he has um, these four questions on when you're working on a tune and, and, and these questions are great. I'm just gonna tell you one, which I think is, is a beautiful question to ask yourself, which elicits a lot of interesting answers. And that is when you're working on something, let's say um, I'm working on a Tom Quayle line. The question is, is how do I want this to feel? Not emotionally, but how do I want this to feel? And, and um, when my friend asked me that question about this particular tune we were talking about, um, I said, easy. I want it to feel easy. So I, I think that a lot of people do not really understand um, how important slow, perfect practicing um, so, sorry, slow, perfect practice and getting a really good quality sound. I don't mean a great amplifier. I mean a producing a quality sounding note and how that, that could mount to basically your level of skill in terms of shredosity. <laughs> <laughs> good word. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I... I Anytime I have to fight the instrument um, because my technique is not up to the job, it, it, it's impossible for it to sound good and, of course, by extension, to feel good as well. So to give you an example in my playing, uh, all of my playing is based around small movements. So when I play, the right hand very rarely moves at all, which means that I haven't really worked on the bigger movements that are required for certain aspects of guitar playing. Mm -hmm. now, of course, I can fake some of those things to, to some extent. So if I was to play um, like a... I can, I can do all that, but the thing is up here, very quickly, <laughs> yeah. tension starts to build in. Mm -hmm. You watch a guy like Mark Lettieri, that's not there. Because what he's done is he's developed this, this particular approach, the larger movement style of playing, the more, the more kind of um, rhythmically kind of uh, groove-based stuff. And I do play groove-based stuff. I'm mean, a massive Wayne Krantz fan. But again, you watch Wayne Krantz play, and it's all like... 
Yeah. Yeah. Tiny movements, but yeah, yeah. you know, very controlled movements. Because I can't do these big movements, I get all this tension in my hands. So inevitably what happens is that it starts to fail and not sound good and feel good. So I develop a psychological dislike of it. I don't want to do it. And therefore I don't get better at it. Whereas if I'd spent the time slowing that stuff down, perfecting the smaller movements so that this tension didn't happen through here and my shoulder didn't get all tense and so on and so forth. I find myself scrunching my whole body up. That's not going to happen. And all of the best funk guys like Corey Wong, you know, Mark Lettieri, they're super relaxed all over. Yeah. Yep. And again, if you take a technique like the Gato, you know, or, or economy picking or whatever, and you are, when you do this, there's like, I always use this analogy, like there's a vein popping out the side of your head, you're gritting your teeth and you're like, <laughs> it sounds bad and you, you're going to run out of steam really quickly and it's just not going to feel good to play. Mm -hmm. Then you combine that with the adrenaline of being on stage or on, you know, in a recording studio or in front of a video camera or whatever. It's not going to happen. I mean, I remember for years, every gig I did, I used to come off stage feeling hideously disappointed in myself <laughs> because my technique was, I, I, I should say, actually, I, I only started playing this way in about 2006. Mm -hmm. So prior to that, I was a much more picking I would say like a Pat Metheny style, where it was a, right. some, a, a combination of picking and, and some hammer-ons and pull-offs. I was obsessed with Pat Metheny. And every gig I did, I, I my technique failed me. When I wanted when I really wanted to go for it, every time it would fail me because it wasn't easy enough. It, I hadn't developed my technique to the point where it was so relaxed and so easy that in the heat of the moment when I have to create something with a high tempo or high subdivision or high note density, there was nothing left in the tank for me to do it. All of my energy was in, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, here we go, here we go. And then just, it just didn't work. Whereas now, the one thing I can guarantee is that no matter what environment I find myself in, and most of my, let's call it the previous day job, obviously I'm not doing this now, was doing masterclasses and clinics um, where you are playing in front of baying guitar players who cannot wait <laughs> for you to screw up. I don't mean, I mean, I'm being really, really harsh. I mean, it's not, harsh. <laughs> they're there to, they're there to, like to enjoy guitar, but you know, it, uh, sometimes it can feel that way that it's like, you know, you, you get on stage and it's like, do the thing, do, do the thing, the legato yeah. thing, do it now. I want to see it. And if you screw it up, it's like, Oh, he can't do it live. But it, I, I think feel you like the part Tom, like where, where, Oh, he can't do it. Wait, let me get my phone. I saw Tom Quayle. Yeah. Saw... Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Straight on social media. Yeah. Um, but, straight on that. But I feel like the technique now is at the point where even on a bad day, that's the thing that's not going to fail me. What will fail me is poor note choice or lack of ability to, 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 to speak properly, you know, to, 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 to be a good orator and, 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 and tell, you know, explain a concept properly or something like that, or just to forget part of a song or something, you know, like, like the melody of a song or something. But what shouldn't fail me is my technique because I, I've worked so hard to get that like you say it feels easy it doesn't feel difficult to do i think that's really important 